Okay, good. So we will we will start. Uh, is it is it connected with the uh, with the Zoom? It is. Okay, perfect. So good morning, everybody. Um, all those of you who are here in the room, and then people who are connected uh, through the Zoom. So uh, today is really very very important uh, day for us uh, at the the African Network of Women in uh, in Astronomy. As you could see in the program, uh, the first two talks uh, will be uh, given uh, actually by uh, the very first uh, awardees of the first uh, AFNOA awards that we are giving for women in astronomy. So uh, this afternoon there will be a special session about uh, the, the network, so please join us for that. And uh, uh, I'm really happy that we managed uh, to make uh, these awards uh, to really um, become true and uh, um, uh, the awards of AFNOA uh, um, are there for really recognizing uh, the work that women are doing uh, in astronomy on the continent uh, in both aspects for their research achievements and then for their contribution to the society and for giving more on one side for giving for recognizing for giving more visibility to the work that women are doing and then for inspiring uh, uh, women uh, and men as well uh, through these uh, words for uh, the astronomy. So the, um, I will now invite Vanessa, to, who was uh, uh, the, the key person uh, together with uh, Carolina uh, for organizing uh, the award. So Vanessa, you can officially announce uh, the winners. Thanks, Majana. Thanks, everyone. Um, you will... <coughs> have seen the, the press release that came out on the 2nd of March where we made the announcement uh, of the winners. But uh, let, there's two awards, and uh, the winner in the Early Career Award was uh, Marie Corsaga from Burkina Faso in France. I asked her to turn on the video. Uh, Marie, if you're there, will you turn your video on? So, and give us a wave. There you are. Hi, Vanessa. And I think, uh, let me read something out and then we'll give a round of applause. Uh, Dr. Kosaga has many achievements under her belt. She's the first Burkin Burkinabe woman to obtain a PhD in astronomy. Marie is a postdoctoral researcher at the Observatoire Astronomique de Strasbourg in France and a lecturer at the University Joseph Kizerbo in Burkina Faso. In her research, Dr. Corsaga works on dark matter and where it is found in galaxies. For that, she uses observations from optical, infrared, and radio telescopes, giving her a broad skill set in astronomy. Dr. Corsaga is also passionate, a passionate advocate for women in STEM in the global and African astronomy communities. She's given a number of high-profile talks, including a TEDx talk, she has spoken at the African Union and was recently honored by the city of Huesca, Spain, in the newly unveiled sundial. She's also a founding member and sits on the editorial board of L'Astronomie Afrique, the first francophone online astronomy magazine in Africa. I think you'll agree with me that she's a well-deserving recipient of this Early Career Award. Let's give her a round of applause. Marie will give her a talk at the end of the session, and uh, we'll hand over your certificate to, uh, to you at uh, a future event, Marie. Nice. <laughs> so, uh, in the senior astronomer category, <laughs> ah. oh, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> So, um, and then in the senior award category, um, the award goes to Professor Rene Kran Kortevach from South Africa. Professor Kran Kortevach is a senior research scholar at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. She's held a number of high profile positions over her career, including leading the astronomy department at the University of Cape Town from 2004 to 2014, and the astronomy department at the University of Renee, can you say it? Guanajuato. <laughs> in Mexico. Her research interests include unveiling the large-scale structure of the universe and understanding how it came to be. 
She's also a user of astronomical observations from various telescopes and has recently discovered a new supercluster of galaxies hidden behind the Milky Way. Her work is internationally recognized and she has received various awards. Renee has supervised over 30 graduate students in her career, attracted significant research funding, both for her own research and for the departments she has led, and she's been a key advocate for the growth of astronomy on the African continent, as well as the support of women in astronomy. The award acknowledges the vast impact that she has had for women in astronomy in Africa. Congratulations, Renee. Let us take the picture, but wait, wait, we will take together with the people. So we didn't mention that these awards uh, are given in collaboration uh, with the uh, International Science uh, Program from uh, Uppsala University. So we have uh, Carla here, who is uh, the principal director of the ISP. You can see Jamal, but Jamal is here with us as well. Barbara is there connected as well, our colleague also from the ISP. You can see Priscilla that is also on the board of, uh, the, of AFNUA. And we have two other board members. I don't know if they're connected, Nana and, uh, and, um, and uh, Samaya. If you can, if you are there, let me check. Just give me a, so Samaya, I don't see Samaya. Oh yes, Samaya, can you please turn on your camera? And then Nana, Nana, I don't see Nana. So Samaya is also there. Samaya, if you can uh, turn on your camera so that we can take a picture all together. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> hi, Samaya. Hi, hi. Uh, congratulations to the winners. My congratulations to the women. Okay. Hi. So now, uh, Carla and Barbara, do you want in the name of the ISP, because I think you will not be here in the afternoon, if you have uh, one minute, two minutes, if you would like to say something, then we have to go to the, to the talks. Okay, of course, uh, congratulations to this, uh, these two um, uh, astronomers that g got these um, awards. Uh, we are very happy to be here to have, uh, I mean, the ISP want to always uh, support uh, uh, women actually science in, in a broad science, but also women in science, because it's very important. And I'm, I'm very happy to be here to see this ceremony, which is very important for Africa, I think, and from astronomy for all our students and our younger researchers, and of course, our other colleagues. So uh, congratulations again, both for the awards, but also for uh, this um, achievement of this uh, network. I think that is the first first um, year, but uh, I hope that we will continue and uh, can, can uh, create a connection with other uh, networks and also with other colleagues and other students. So I think it's a very important step today and um, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. I just want to say that I'm very impressed by these achievements and I think it's really great for 
uh, women in uh, in astronomy to have uh, this network and uh, I'm very pleased to have had the opportunity to be present here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to both of you and all the support from the ISP. We really appreciate and once again uh, from the network our uh, great thanks for the for the African Astronomical Society. And uh, now we will go to the first talk. Uh, uh, then uh, after that, uh, Marie, uh, we will go to, to Marie's talk. So the first talk will be given by Rene. Congratulations, Rene, once <coughs> again. And Rene will tell us about uh, what can Mirkat uh, tell us about galaxy over densities hidden behind the Milky Way. So I will let you know when uh, five minutes are left. Thank you very much. Okay, um, uh, thank you, uh, Mirjana. And uh, I must say, um, I was quite uh, not just honored, but very surprised when I heard that I was the first recipient of this senior award. And uh, it really is an honor. And I would like to also thank the, all the team who have set this up because I think the primary goal is to showcase women in astronomy and what they can do. And hopefully it will really encourage young women to continue or start a career in astronomy. So thank you for that. Um, yeah. Okay, good. And that brings me to the, um, to the science that I will talk about. So I'll talk about um, a project that I've been working on over many years or most of the years of my career, but various different aspects of it. And that's looking at um, galaxy distribution that's hidden behind the Milky Way. And I'll give a very brief overview. Uh, there's no, not enough time to why that's interesting, but then I'll focus really on the recent research we have done using Meerkat in that aspect, and that's really to learn more about the innermost structures and that uh, supercluster that Vanessa just mentioned before that we discovered a few years ago now. And so why study galaxy distribution in the zone of avoidance? Some of you have known me, have seen that slice. Um, why are we not content with uh, studying the universe in about 80% of the sky? Why do we care about this region that's so difficult to peer through because of the star density, the dust obscuration, and many other effects? And the reason is that it's really an obstacle to many cosmological studies. And here are a few of the reasons why that is important. I will focus really at this moment on the peculiar velocity of the local group, which is still not fully explained, and a better insight into the large bulk flows, the volumes that involve uh, large flows, uh, to, to learn more about that. And while in the beginning we thought, and consistent with um, cosmology at that time, that most of the flow was generated quite local, with the, the great attractor, and it was kind of a fight between who was stronger there, and then it became a question, maybe Shapley, who's about here, also has a big uh, part to play. And now there's another question because there's another major supercluster, not too far from Shapley, Shapley's here, in the Vila constellation that we have just seen the first glimpse, glimpse of, and it's even slightly further than Shapley. And why is it interesting? Because one of the most burning and still controversial questions, as I said, in, in, in not just the last couple of years, but it has been become prominent again in the last couple of years, is that we still don't know the full amplitude and the convergence radius, so within which volume that bulk flow is generated. And while a large fraction is generated locally, there's clear evidence now that there's a residual bulk flow of substantial size, 270 kilometers per second, that's arising from larger distances, pointing close to Vila, exactly where we found this supercluster, uh, but only parts of it because of the um, galactic plane. 
So what can we do? And a lot of work has been done over the last two decades to find galaxy, the galaxy distribution, and we have narrowed it down considerably, this zone of avoidance, through optical near-infrared and X-ray studies. But the inner five degrees, whatever method you use, does remain impen impenetrable, except if you use H1 surveys. They can just peer through. They are not affected by dust and hardly affected by the foreground stars they just go through. And so that's a very powerful tool. And that was realized quite early on. I'll show you here the first work I was involved in was the Dwingelow Obscured Galaxy Survey. It was a small telescope then. Um, it actually was the largest telescope for three months in 1956, but it was the oldest small telescope still working in the 90s, and we used it for a systematic survey, not too out to a large volumes and, and quite shallow, but it found about 120 galaxies, and one of the most famous one is the Dwingelow 1 galaxy, which we found through the H1 detection here, and it would have been the eighth brightest galaxy in the optical in the sky if it were not lying behind the Milky Way. So there is stuff out there nearby, big, that we don't know about. And that's interesting. The next major survey was the Parkes Multi-Beam Survey. I think it's known to many people as the first systematic survey that covered in H1 the whole southern hemisphere, including a northern extension up to 25 degrees. It's well known. It has 5,700 galaxies. I imagine, compare that, that's, a, that's more than half the sky, and that's as good as we were for systematic surveys from H1. So it's still very shallow, even though this instrument was designed to be a survey instrument. What is less well known is that at the same time in these observations, there was a deeper survey done just along the zone of avoidance was in plus and minus five degrees, five times deeper, exactly to probe that part of the sky where no other method works, and it was going to be sensitive to normal spiral galaxies in the great attractor region. And it actually was, because here what you see here, now this is a redshift slice, it goes out, it's about plus and minus five degrees wide in distance, that was the galaxy distribution that was known before. And then when we added what we found with the Parkes multi-beam survey, there's, a, there's 960 galaxies in total. And what you can see is just there where there's the great attractor, there's an overdensity, there's a wall-like structure. So it looks very much like Coma and the Great Wall. So it's a massive, um, large um, supercluster, really, that we're seeing here, which was called the um, Great Attractor. And so all very good, and we learned much more, but still not that much, because it's still very shallow. You know, this is, this is deeper than high pass, but it's one galaxy per two square degrees that we have discovered there. It doesn't cover a large volume, and because it was single dish observations, we could not peer into the innermost um, galactic plane because the continuum levels below 1.5 are quite uh, high and uh, perturb that. So going to what, what, what we have found now, so it was first a small a galaxy, there was a group I haven't talked about, which we confirmed in H1. We now know more about the great attractor, so first we thought that's about all. But then, as I said, we found this large supercluster. There was a hint of it already for a long time, but when it became apparent that we had this residual bulk flow coming from around this direction, from sources that were quite distant, around 18,000 kilometers per second, we did a spectroscopic campaign using a omega and salt and had about 4,500 new um, spectros spectroscopic results from galaxies here. And what we found is that there's indeed, looking at all the, all the redshifts in this area, actually in this area, we found this incredible peak with the shoulders, very typical for a supercluster, that's centered at 18,000 kilometers per second. And if you look at the similar redshift slice, this now goes to plus and minus 10 degrees, this is again a part of the sky where nothing was known. You can see this supercluster, this wall-like structure here, which 
we call the main wall, the primary wall, and indications of another wall over here that seems to possibly merge somewhere here. But this is just from data above the plane and below the plane, because as I said before, you know, we could only, with optical spectroscopy, peer above four, five, or six degrees, or below minus five or six degrees, where the dust and star is high, star density is high, we cannot find anything. And that's where, obviously, the H1 surveys come in. And if you have a telescope in your backyard nowadays, right, that is one of the most powerful L-band telescopes, so which contains the H1 uh, line out to quite large distances, then you obviously want to think what to, what to do with that to, to learn more about that. And that's what we have done in uh, recent years. So let me start with some of the work that we've done there. Um, <clears throat> this is just to show you what we planned already in uh, early on in 2016, was presented at the Meerkat Science Workshop. Um, and uh, these are, this is just the survey we have done around the Vila supercluster. All the larger dots here are spectroscopic redshifts Note the prominence around, around uh, 16,000 to 24,000. You can see it here. Most of the fields that we have observed is very strong, not here. Um, but this is what we have, and we already learned that it does contribute to the, to the flow motion of our local group even. You know, it's, you see it's sparsely sampled, and obviously there's nothing where the dust and star density is high. So that's where we want to do a systematic H1 survey. We proposed it in 2020. It was approved early 2021, and Sabacha will be working on that. We have the first data. But we didn't want to wait that, oh yes, and that's the main goal, map all the galaxies that are more H1 rich than a typical spiral galaxy out to that distant range. And with Meerkat 64, we can do that in five minutes per pointing if we Nyquist sample. And so these are kind of the projects that I will talk about. There's a whole lot of people and students and, and uh, just because of the African network, these are a lot of female students here that are involved in this research. And so what we did is in 2018, we used Meerkat for a pilot project, Meerkat 16, with the full um, um, uh, channel resolution. We didn't, what we did is we didn't dare to dive directly into the completely dark zone because it's a new instrument and we didn't know how sensitive it was. So if we find something or nothing, we don't know why. And so we focused first on an area that we know there's a huge overdensity of Vila here. All these galaxies that have redshifts around the Vila supercluster, we see some extension going over here. So we had six fields over here that we looked at and we knew there were lots of galaxies there, so we should find a lot of data. And that's, that's what we did. So what you find here is the results from, these, um, from this pilot project, Meerkat 16 detections. It's actually it's a bit old because, uh, and we have updated it since, but uh, what you can see here, the, the, these are all the detections, these little blobs of, uh, of that you see in this plot. And uh, the interesting velocity range is from, from about orange to yellow. And you can see that we do detect them, and we do see a wall-like structure going over here. We also found an unknown, very nearby big galaxy over there where there's a lot of extinction. But we didn't see anything here where we have that high overdensity, and that was a bit peculiar because there is that cluster there, and we didn't quite understand why we didn't find anything. So actually, was a lot of H alpha in the spectra. But, and the X-ray tells us there's a cluster there, but it was not massive according to X-ray, more like a Virgo, where you expect a lot of spiral-rich galaxies. But we did other follow-up observations, and that's another student who works not in the radio, but in the near-infrared, and so she did photometry in the near-infrared of a lot of the cluster candidates, and you can see that this cluster is actually very rich. It's as rich as the Norma cluster in the Great Attractor, and if you look at the redshift distribution here from the H1 detections, 
These are the redshifts that we have at the core of this cluster. Half of them are spirals, none were detected. So that actually means that all the galaxies, we should have detected them, we know that. So they are all massively H1 deficient and that confirms that this must be a very rich cluster. So that was a nice discovery. Good, <clears throat> so what, what next? Um, then, uh, as I said, the Meerkat uh, 64 survey, we want to do the whole area of the Vila supercluster because we have now seen that it works. We find these galaxies easily at that distance, the normal, normal galaxies. So, uh, as I said, the proposal was accepted to do this. Observations were completed. Sambatra has started looking at, uh, at the data and it's up to expectations, except in a few areas of very high continuum. But this is just starting. So I cannot say much about, about these uh, eight blocks that we observed, 660 fields, Nyquist samples. But, oops, what I want to talk about is, you might be wondering what these red dots are here, and that actually in a different grid, that's actually part of the sky that has already been observed. And what that is, is similar to Kenda Knowles, um, who did a talk about the Meerkat cluster survey. There was another legacy survey done that just covered the whole galactic plane within plus uh, over a three degree strip along the plane of the Milky Way. And it was mainly aimed for people to study the galaxy and the galactic sources. But you know, if you've looked so long at galaxies in the zone of avoidance, you immediately say, but hey, here's exquisite data, one hour per pointing with an RMS of this low, we can easily find galaxies out to the Vila supercluster distance, if not further. So let's, let's do that, let's use that. And we were approved the time to actually, or, or to use the, the survey exactly for that. And that's what we did. We're most interested here in Vila. You can see this predicted crossing over here if we find it. And then there's obviously um, the great attractor. Can we learn more about it? There's a more distant filament crossing. The Ophiuchus and op uh, the local void is very interesting because under dense regions are equally important to flows as over densities. They, they kind of reject mass or uh, expel, uh, what's the word? Well, push it away while the others attract. So mapping a void is very important, sounds less exciting. Um, and so we started exploring exactly that strip um, and to look at the H1 data. And <clears throat> this 900 pointings, it actually doesn't sound like much a strip of three degrees, but it's a survey of 540 square degrees. And so we started with the first focus areas, exactly the, the, the stuff that I talked about, Vila supercluster, the great attractor, and the local void. And we looked at uh, strips of 30 degrees. Um, each were pulled together in 10, uh, in 10 mosaics of 22 pointings. And what you see colored here is the areas that I'll show some very preliminary results from. So these are all the fields. This is overlaid on a continuum map. Uh, of the L-band taken with high pass. And uh, there's a bit of var varying um, uh, sensitivity where the continuum, foreground continuum is low. It's very good, it's 0.3, going rising a bit here and going even higher. But overall, it's, it's exactly what we expected. As I said, um, we made these mosaics of about uh, 22 degrees, has about this form. And that ensures that we have fields of about three by three degrees of fairly uniform coverage for our analysis. So we created H1 data cubes as they are called. And here's one of the first data cubes that we looked at. And what you can see here is the continuum image. And what you can see here is the RMS of a central field in this cube. And you can see that the H1 data, despite all the continuum sources here is pretty good Sources like these don't bother as much. This stuff is actually a bit more of a concern. So we looked at the 
objects and try to see if what we're finding is right. There's not many galaxies in the zone of avoidance. That's the whole problem, right? And so the only stuff that we can compare to are the few galaxies that Haizoa found. And, you, and we discovered them all, rediscovered them all. You can see some examples here. And more importantly, we could see that our flux, which we didn't get right in the first time, but in the second time, actually is uh, right spot on. And so let me then go to some of the, the final few slides, but just very quickly, some of the very first results. And some of this might still change, but just to give you insight. This is in the Vila, um, mosaic in the Vila supercluster crossing uh, along the plane. So you see quite a lot of galaxies were found. It's overlaid on the continuum here. And some butcher already put everything that's at the Vila distance in red. So you see we find many galaxies there. Here you have some, uh, you can probably not see it, but some that have a green square around them. They are here. And you can see that despite the distance, despite the coarse velocity resolution, because it's 4K data, we get very nice results. And if you look at the redshift distribution of 10, the 10 mosaics, 30 degrees, then you can see that um, overall it looks very similar to what is expected from simulations. There's a big peak here that's also known um, adjacent to the Milky Way. There's a clear overdensity here at the high end where we have the Vila supercluster. And if you zoom in, you can actually, on, on two mosaics here and two others there, you can actually see exactly where those other walls are crossing. And they indeed cross the galactic plane. And so that's very promising for the big Vila supercluster survey. Here a quick result from the Great Attractor region. Um, 480 galaxies in total were detected, 42 of which were Hyzoa galaxies. But what you can see, again, these are the simulations. You see this massive overdensity here. And so while we already knew part of that, that there was the worst uh, galaxies there that belong to the great attractor overdensity, it's very, very, very prominent still at these very low galactic latitudes and all the, all the other galaxies that were found at the great attractor distance look entirely normal. And I was very excited when Nadia showed me this plot and this is the st structure in redshift space of, of all these orange galaxies here. And you see this nice filamentary structure. Here's the great attractor area. Here it goes towards Ophiuchus. This could be part of the local void already. So I have one last uh, slide, really, and that's now the area of the local void. And not surprising, I mean, uh, there's not that many galaxies found. Note this only goes out to 8,000 because Sushma really only wanted to focus on the local void and the population in voids. And so there's only like 30 galaxies found. Um, and a uh, few of these nearby ones were known, but you can see that it's nearly completely empty up to here, and we only start picking up galaxies at about 5,000 um, kilometers per second. That's also kind of where a focus starts. So it's really, oops, sorry, it's really very, very empty. She's now working to complete that all the way to the extent of the local void, and then study those galaxies in detail. It's already very interesting that some of the galaxies, the Meerkat actually, this is a Hyzoa galaxy in, in, in that catalog, and actually the resolution of Meerkat find that's actually a small group. Something that we found quite often for the, for the few objects that we have here, and that's probably because we have an underdense region, and these galaxies don't evolve very much. They live in a very protected environment, quasi, if they're there. Okay, so those are the very first results, and um, this is kind of a summary, really. So I hope I've convinced you that H1 surveys provide a powerful probe into uncovering large-scale structures that are hidden behind the zone of avoidance. Meerkat is a fantastic H1 telescope, obviously also for other research, but we are excited about the H1. I mentioned all of this. I just want to make one last point, and uh, that's something that... Um, Michelle Lochner mentioned, you know, we are interested in the knowns, unknowns, 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 and every survey has them, and indeed, I didn't have time to talk about that, 
but there we find a massive, not a, 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 not a massive, a very giant H1 galaxy. It is so big and so low H1 column density that it doesn't fit on any scaling relation. So we have follow-up observations on that. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Thank you very much. Um, we have a few minutes for the questions. Any questions here uh, in the public? Yes, Tolu, please. Let me check if there is anything in the chat. Okay, a nice talk, and uh, really it is a very good input for the future research. Um, my question is, uh, one, how do you model the voids and what are these voids? The other question I have is, um, for the large scale structure, of course, it is okay for the Lambda CDM model. But at the galactic plane, uh, the uh, lambda part has no component. But I wonder how you identify the uh, polarity of the CDM at the galactic uh, plane level. Is it the, uh, the, the, dark, the cold dark matter part or the relic part? Um, so first, the first part about how do we measure um, the under density or the over density. And that's the one thing that is so powerful about the H1 surveys is because the H1 is not affected by... The H1 is not affected by the foreground dust or anything. So it comes through. So what, what the plan is to exactly see what the limit is in certain areas of our sensitivity calculate the completeness limit or the, the sensitivity curve, and then compare that to what we expect from a typical H1 mass function, what we see there. And we've already done that in a few cases. And what you will find is then that you can scale that, but for a certain volume, you expect a certain number of galaxies. And we already now know that I haven't done the calculations yet based on the varying RMS, but if we just take the simulations, we would have expected eight times more galaxies in the local void. The RMS is there a bit higher, so it might probably be more like um, <clears throat> uh, four times, but it's still severely under dense. And the same you can do for the over densities. That's the other thing. And obviously we cannot determine anything about the Lambda C, um, CDM model itself. That's not what we can do. But what we can do with these studies is we can compare the mass distribution in the universe through the distribution of galaxies, and that will tell us where we expect the flows to go by summing up. And then, yeah, and then we compare that to what is predicted from the CMB. And, that's, and, and there's still that, um, that discussion about what volume is it generated in and how far out do we have to go to make it match? If it goes out very far, it's a cosmological problem because then the universe is not homogeneous at large scales. So um, yeah, the cosmologists the don't the like part, these I results. The part. <laughs> I think we will have to move on. Yes. Let me just check if there is any very, very quick question from the public, but no, I cannot. I think it's already moved. Maybe, because I, I cannot uh, reach. Uh, but well, anyway, I I'm still here, and yes, otherwise they, they can, yes, they can ask me. The uh, Thank you so the... much, uh, Rene. Thank you, let us. <laughs> yeah, I think there were no questions in there. So let us, uh, we, will, we will now continue um, for the second speaker. Uh, so Marie, um, will uh, give a talk about the cold baryons uh, to uh, halo mass relation of galaxies. Uh, so congr congratulations, Marie, once again. And uh, I will let you know when, um, uh, I will let you know when three minutes are, are left. Thanks. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank the uh, AFAS organizing committee for inviting me uh, to give this presentation. And I would like also to thank the uh, African Network of Women in Astronomy and IST, ISP for the award. It's an absolute honor that I will uh, share this for the rest of my uh, professional career. So, um, I cannot move my slide. Okay, it's fine. So uh, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about distribution of dark matter in, ga in galaxies, especially the, baryonic, the relation between the baryonic mass and the halo mass in galaxies. And uh, this is an uh, ongoing work that I am uh, conducting in collaboration with uh, Benoit Fame, uh, Jonathan uh, uh, Fredelich, a Lorenzo Posti at the uh, Observatoire Astronomique de Strasbourg. So, as we know, we un the universe is composed of about 25% of uh, dark matter, uh, while the baryonic matter represents only 5%. So, to understand the formation and evolution of the universe, we need to understand uh, the properties of dark matters. And um, we know that uh, we cannot detect dark matter directly using our instruments uh, because this matter does not uh, uh, really interact with uh, ordinary uh, matter and um, uh, it makes it difficult to detect using uh, telescope and uh, so, uh, satellites and so on. Uh, however, experimental methods can be used to describe the presence of dark matter and uh, in, and also uh, help to study the properties, to understand the properties of dark matter. So in cosmological uh, scale, dark matter can be detected thanks to uh, observation of the cosmo, uh, cosmic microwave background, uh, for example, uh, and the gravitational lensing method in which uh, for where dark matter creates uh, gravitational lenses that uh, uh, disturb background galaxies. Uh, in, galactical, in galactic scale, dark matter can be also detected thanks to, um, I, I mean, dark matter can be also uh, described thanks to the mass model uh, method for which uh, we can uh, determine the mass distribution of dark matter um, in galaxies by combining the uh, the rotation curve and uh, the distribution of uh, the visible component. And this is uh, the uh, method that I am using in order to uh, study the dark matter distribution in galaxy. And uh, I'm going to extensively talk about this method in this presentation. So uh, the best place to study uh, dark matter distribution is uh, inside galaxies, especially spiral and irregular galaxies because um, these galaxies are gas-rich galaxies, and this is uh, suitable for uh, H1 observation. And uh, we know that H1 observation are good to use to study uh, dark matter distribution because the H1 rotation curve goes well beyond the optical radius where dark matter starts to become the uh, dominant component. And uh, in terms of uh, in this, in scaling relation, understanding the properties of uh, galaxies and dark matter, uh, we know that um, this, uh, the properties of dark matter and uh, galaxies are tightly uh, correlated with the halo mass. So we want to uh, use dark matter density profile to consider density profile in order to uh, derive the, uh, the mass of the halo and um, investigate the relation between the baryonic mass and the halo mass in galaxies. And this is uh, what I am uh, uh, working in collaboration with uh, my team. And uh, what we want to do is uh, really to investigate the stellar to mass relation and also the cold baryon to halo mass relation. And for the cold baryon, uh, we include in the stellar mass, we include the atomic gas in order also to see the influence that the atomic gas can have in the distribution of uh, dark matter. And so uh, we use uh, two data uh, sets, uh, spark data and little things. And uh, we combine uh, for each data, we have uh, the kinematical 
data and the photometric data available. So for SPAC data, which stands for pixel photometry and accurate rotation curve, we use 175 H1 gal a rotation curve with uh, a near infrared uh, photometric data collected by uh, Lely and Tal in 2016. And uh, Spark data, it's good. We, we decided to use this data because it covers almost all morphological type from irregular to lenticular galaxies. And uh, it's um, also um, a good way to really understand the distribution of dark matter in galaxies, in uh, a range of uh, galaxies, not only focusing on uh, late type or, or early type galaxies, but almost covering uh, a large range of galaxies. And um, uh, in 2019, we published a paper also uh, showing the importance of using H1 uh, rotation curve to study the dark matter distribution, because here we can see uh, we um, in the plot, uh, we use the optical uh, uh, rotation curve to construct dark matter. And the second panel, uh, the middle one, correspond to the uh, H1 uh, rotation curve. And uh, so on. We, we also uh, use hybrid rotation curve that means combine uh, optical and H1. And to, in order to see the distribution, how the dark matter can be constrained using this rotation curve. And we noticed, uh, we found that if the H1, if the optical rotation curve goes far enough uh, in the outer part of the galaxies, we can use it to constrain a dark matter parameter and it will give us best result because optical are um, a higher, have higher resolution compared to H1 observations. But the problem is most of the optical data observation cannot go far enough. They cannot reach the optical radius of the galaxy. So it's uh, better to use uh, H1 data to construct, uh, to construct dark matter parameter, to study dark matter parameter in the inner and outer region of galaxy. This is why we use it. We are uh, focusing on uh, galaxies that have H1 rotation curve and photometric data available. And uh, so I said, we also include little things data. Uh, little things data are uh, dwarf irregular galaxies and uh, they have solar, a, a stellar mass uh, below 10 to eight solar masses, mass, mass yeah, 10 to eight solar mass. And these galaxies are also good to, to study um, uh, dark matter distribution because for these galaxies, we have a slowing, uh, rising rotation curve in uh, the inner part, um, stating the presence of dark matter in the inner part of this galaxy. So it's uh, good to study the dark, if we want to uh, better understand the distribution of the dark matter, to uh, include these galaxies in order to see how dark matter is distributed in the inner part and also in the outer part. And um, um, we can also check the Casper uh, core problem uh, with these galaxies, which uh, because uh, the simulation predicts that all galaxies are, uh, the distribution of dark matter is self-similar inside galaxies. And uh, uh, the, these in uh, the galaxies are well fitted with the dark matter are well, is well fitted with a Caspi NFW profile. And in this, our work, we want to also um, uh, use the core as uh, density, dark matter density to fit uh, our rotation curve in order to compare the two models, the CASP, the two profile, the CASP and the constant profile, dark matter profile. So uh, to construct the mass model, uh, we combine kinematical data and uh, photometric data. And uh, in order to get a good constraint of the dark matter parameters, uh, we uh, remove galaxies for which we do not have enough point in the rotation curve, that's uh, about uh, uh, galaxies with at least, uh, which have uh, uh, less than six points in the rotation curve. And then we started with a sample of 192 galaxies, that means spark and uh, little things uh, sample uh, data. And uh, we end up with a sample of 180 uh, galaxies that we use to uh, do our study. 
And to construct the mass model, uh, we, as I said, we combine kinematical data, uh, that means the H1 rotation curve and photometric data. And uh, so uh, we use two models. Uh, like I said at the beginning, we want to see, to also check the cross core problem. So we use the constant Dekelizawa profile to, um, to describe the dark matter uh, density uh, distribution in the galaxies. And this uh, profile is characterized by a variable inner slope, a, a dimensionless uh, concentration parameter C, and uh, the halo mass M200. And we also use the navarro franklin white CASPI profile, for which the dark matter density profile is uh, not constant in the center, but it's a uh, CASPI in the center. And uh, this profile is characterized by a concentration and a, a halo mass M200. So the first profile, we have three parameters to constrain the dark matter, uh, with, dark, with dark matter, and uh, the second one, uh, we have only two parameters. So that means in the central part of the galaxy's rotation curve, it will be, um, it will be hard to really uh, fit the central part with how models, but we will see that later. And so the final rotation curve is the quadratic sum of the individual contribution of the gas, the star, and the dark matter components. And so uh, the gas contribution, we can, uh, the velocity is uh, derived directly from the H1 flux. By the star velocity is derived from the photometric data and the dark matter components uh, derived, uh, we use the two models, the Dekelizawa and the navarro franklin white to get it. And so uh, the rotation curve, uh, we fitted the rotation curve using the MCMC method. And for that, we assume uh, different prior on the parameters that I shown here. I'm not going to get into details, uh, but uh, I can talk about it uh, uh, later if you want to know more about. And for each parameter, we define the best value to be the median of the posterior distribution and the uncertainty is given by the 16th and 84th percentile. And here I show an example of a mass model that we constructed for the galaxy NGC 2998. And uh, the left end panel corresponds to the posterior distribution of the different parameters, the mass to late ratio, the concentration, the inner slope, and the halo mass for Dekelizawa profile, DZ. And this is for Navarro Frank and White profile, the, trip, the two parameters for the dark matter, hello, and the mass to light ratio for the baryonic component. And uh, the mass model is shown in the right and uh, panel. So um, we, we have the observed rotation curve. Okay, we plot the velocity as a function of the radius, which give has the uh, rotation curve of the galaxy. So the dot, uh, the dot point black dot correspond to the observed rotation curve. The uh, blue line correspond to the gas contribution. The yellow line correspond to the star contribution. And the dark matter uh, contribution is uh, showing in a magenta line. And the model, that means the quadratic sum of the three components, is showing in uh, the red line. And we can see that when using the Dekelzao profile, we can we, the red line fits very well the inner part and the outer part of the rotation curve. But when we look at the NFW model, we can see a discrepancy between the observed rotation curve and the uh, model in the central part of the galaxies. So this means that uh, NFW uh, Dekelzao we prefer Dekelzao to better constrain the dark matter profile uh, instead of using. NFW. And so, like I said at the beginning, we want to uh, study the relation between the um, baryonic parameters, uh, uh, baryonic mass, and the halo mass in order to better understand the dark matter properties. So, uh, before I uh, start the different relation, I uh, plot the different relation, we remove galaxies for which we, we do not have uh, the halo mass. We found the halo mass below. 10 to 9, because this galaxy is difficult to better constrain the dark matter parameter with close with dispersion, um, the 
uh, the scatter is uh, very large and uh, that uh, and uh, the parameters that uh, the dark matter parameters so we remove these galaxies before uh, doing how uh, studying how a scaling relation and here i plot the stellar the h1 mass as a function of the stellar mass and this is using the Dekelzau profile and this is uh, the nfw nfw1 and so yes and uh, in the red dot correspond to spark data and the blue open circle correspond to little things data. I, I put two, two different color because I want to, to see where the uh, dwarf galaxy, the little thing galaxy led in the plot. And now you can see, we can really see that these galaxies are located at the bottom. And uh, so for comparison, I also plot uh, black contours uh, for data taken from uh, Maddox et in 2015. And uh, the um, a diagonal mark correspond to the one-to-one -one relation of equal H1 and uh, stellar mass. And now uh, you can see that uh, uh, for low uh, mass galaxies, they are uh, um, largely dominated by gas, by cold gas. And now uh, you can see the, um, the H1 mass is a uh, higher um, than uh, a stellar mass for low massive uh, for low mass galaxies and for uh, massive galaxies uh, they are located under the one to one line relation uh, one to one relation and uh, you can see uh, that uh, these uh, galaxies are uh, dominated by star so the uh, stellar mass is higher compare uh, is higher than the H1 mass. And for the two uh, profiles, I show the plot for the two profiles. I don't know why it's, okay. Yes. And uh, like I said at the beginning, we were also want to investigate the relation between the stellar mass, the baryonic mass and the halo mass. And here I plot the stellar mass as a function of the uh, halo mass. And uh, we see that, um, you can observe that um, high mass galaxies appear to, to reside in more massive halo. And uh, also the scatter uh, between the, the uh, data is um, uh, smaller in, uh, when using Dekelzau profile compared to NFW profile, uh, stating again that uh, we can better constrain the dark matter parameters using Dekelzau compared to NFW. And now I also plot the baryonic mass as a function of the halo mass. And in this case, we add the, uh, in the, we add the atomic gas in uh, the relation. And now uh, we, we, uh, we can see a linear increasing stellar mass with the halo for uh, the different plots here. And, uh, so and uh, this is not really in agreement three, with uh, three minutes. Well, sorry three minutes three minutes oh, okay this is not uh, really in agreement with uh, previous work because they can uh, they show a fast uh, rising route um, increasing uh, stellar mass as a function of the halo mass until a halo mass of uh, values of 12 and then it's uh, start uh, uh, being the, and, and we found a linear uh, trend. And uh, also we plot the star fraction as uh, a function, uh, star, stellar mass fraction as a function of the stellar mass. And we see a monotically increasing relation between uh, uh, the two uh, parameters. And this is also not in agreement with the literature uh, because uh, the, in the paper of uh, Posse et al. in 2019, they say that Mossa et al. in 2019 found a break uh, at uh, a certain uh, values of the stellar mass at about uh, 12, uh, uh, a range of 12 and 11. And uh, after that, uh, they see a break uh, of star formation. And, uh, but we, in our study, we find a linear without no brick. And so we are started working to understand the reason of uh, this uh, discrepancy with the literature. Maybe it's because it's due to the uh, different, uh, 
any factual environmental the selection of the sample and so on so this is the summary because we're still working on and not really going to get into detail i before i finish i would like to talk about a project that we are going to conduct this summer in Burkina Faso. And uh, so as some of uh, you may know, Burkina Faso is a um, um, subject of uh, terror attacks since uh, 2015. And uh, as a result, almost 2 million people have been internally displaced so far. And one consequence is that uh, women and children have become the most vulnerable of, of uh, this violence, and specifically children, uh, because we have seen that many children have stopped going to school, even uh, they still have access to. So this specific pro, uh, project that we are planning to conduct uh, during this summer aim to promote promo education among these internally displaced population. And the idea is uh, to use astronomy to make education and school fund uh, again for these uh, children. And the project has been entirely funded by the OAD. And uh, we also have a local uh, and international partner. And on top of uh, also on top of promoting education, we also seek to teach um, peace and alleviate uh, the trauma and job uh, during the violence. And so, uh, practically, we have selected uh, three camps. Uh, yeah, we have selected three camps in Burkina Faso, and uh, for each camp, we plan to organize three days fun activities in. Uh, in science, but uh, also organizing a stargazing session. And because we plan to alleviate also the trauma uh, endured during the, the attacks, we also include cultural activities that these children can uh, very much relate to. So also, because it's uh, a development project, we aim also to be in line with the uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goal. And so for context, uh, there are 17 uh, uh, SDGs that have been outlined by the UN. And uh, we will uh, predict that, um, we are predicting that uh, the project will impact four of those uh, that these are, uh, um, SDG 4, 5, 10, and uh, 16. So more specifically, uh, we plan that the project uh, uh, will impact SDG 4 by promoting science among these children. Uh, the SDG 10, uh, uh, which is about reducing, um, reducing inequality, we plan to contribute to bridge the gap between children and uh, this camp and uh, the rest of the population and the rest of the population. And also in the selection of the participant, we want to impact uh, SDG um, five, which is about gender equality and uh, by giving pri priority to, to young girls. And uh, also finally, we want to contribute uh, to help uh, teach, um, to, we want to help uh, teach about science and uh, togetherness. Uh, and uh, in this case, we, we, we want to seek, the, uh, we seek the impact on uh, SDG 16. And so I think I'm going to stop here. Uh, if you are interested uh, uh, by this project, uh, please feel free to, to get in touch with me. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Marie, for, okay. for the talk uh, and then the, the activities uh, that you're planning for this year. We have time for a quick question. Uh, okay, there are two questions. Uh, first, Gemma, okay, the quick questions, please. Okay. Quick question, quick uh, answer because we are delayed. Gemma, I'll go ahead. Okay, uh, Marie, congratu congratulations for your well-deserved uh, uh, awards, first of all. Well, I'm an, an outsider to your field, but I want to ask you a general question, actually. You mentioned initially the, uh, the, the, the bullet cluster to be a, uh, among the, the best proof of, in fact, it is perhaps the best proof that people bring about dark matter, almost direct, comparing to the, uh, you know, the, 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 the velocity distribution and, 
and the clusters dynamics. Yet uh, there is some controversy, I mean, I have read here and there about the traditional interpretation of the bullet clusters as the, I mean, uh, as far as the dark matter. Quick, uh, has the must, quick. Yes, yeah, I just finished. Has the dust has settled? And how robust is the interpretation of the, one of the best proof of dark matter, which is a bullet cluster uh, in terms of interpretation dark matter? Just if uh, you may want to comment on that. Okay. Um, Thank you, Jamal, for the question. Uh, I just want to, to say, okay, um, the best, it's uh, difficult to say the best way to really uh, start with dark matter distribution. But uh, for me, uh, because we want to study the, this, the dark matter distribution inside the galaxies, this is why I say in galactical scale, we use the uh, mass model to, to, to study this. But uh, in cosmological scale, yes, uh, I think uh, using the ballet cluster also can be a, um, a good way to to better understand dark matter distribution uh, to understand the dark matter because uh, in this scale because it's uh, we're talking about uh, dark matter outside or in inside the universe in general but not only inside the galaxies because our aim is to understand the dynamics inside galaxies but we're uh, talking about uh, a cluster emerging between collision between two galaxies cluster uh, can also generate because we can detect, uh, they, we can have detection on the X-ray uh, because of the coalition, they can uh, uh, make uh, the, uh, uh, I, the area, the, the gas hot, and then uh, this gas can be detected in uh, X-ray uh, observations. And I think, okay, uh, for, for me, I think uh, galaxies, the mass model can be also good, the best way to really understand with uh, dark matter distributions and the properties. I don't know if I, I answer the question. We, we will have to move uh, move on, unfortunately. Thank you so much, uh, Marie. Are you please uh, put the question in the chat? <laughs> So please, for the for the uh, uh, further questions, just put in the chat or in the Slack channel. Uh, congratulations once again, and then uh, James will take over. James, yeah. Okay. So just before James takes over, just have to announce a few changes to the program because the session ran over time. So this session will start will start now. So if you need to take your tea, can you please just go outside and take your tea and then come back into the venue. Uh, immediately um so the so the reason we're doing that is that we will we will do away with the current tea break that's there from 11 40 to 11 50 so you take your tea now and then after this session we'll have a five minute to to move between the two venues and then uh the next session here which is session 17 will start at 12 o'clock